purpose of this step is just, hey, let's just make an observation what actually happened. And so it, it attracts. Uh, step six says do this. Move the acetate. Oops, I set it down, which is the acetate. Oh, here's the acetate. It says move the acetate strip towards the pit ball very slowly and carefully so you could observe the effect of distance. And you might have already seen that, but I'll just do it again here. Uh, here, when I'm at a far distance, I would say there's very little attraction. Kind of a medium distance, there's a medium amount of attraction. And a short, di whoa, short distance, there's a lot of attraction. And so notice then that the amount of attraction depends on how close you are. And in fact, they even say here, can you express this as a proportion? So, excuse me, <coughs> I mean, I'm going to grab a little water here because I'm just not used to talking, so my, my voice is a little hoarse. All right, first day. Okay, but the uh, proportion, I would say this way. I mean, how would you describe it in a math class? When, when one thing is big, so when distance is big, the force is small. On the other hand, when the distance is small, the force is big. And we would call that an inverse proportion. And so they are inversely proportioned. Now, if you've gone a little bit farther in the lecture, just so that I don't confuse anybody, um, it's actually inversely proportional to the distance squared. It's not just the distance, it's the distance squared. And that was that uh, in measurements of, 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 of measuring values that uh, Coulomb did. And uh, so we're not measuring how much the force is, so I don't think we can say it's pro inversely proportional to the square. We can't quite get that conclusion, but I'm going to say that because that's what Coulomb did, and that's why you know, we uh, name the units of charge Coulombs in, in his honor because he, of Coulomb's law, and he found that proportionality. But it's inversely proportional is, is, is good enough for what, what, what we have here in step six. All right. Now step seven is kind of where the, the physics starts to, to come in. And I've explained a lot of this, but I'll, but I'll keep going here. Watch this. Uh, number seven. It says, the vinyl plastic, and so let me find the, my vinyl. Here's my vinyl. Has a greater affinity, which is a fancy word for attraction. It has a greater attraction for the electrons than the wool does. So when the wool and the vinyl are brought together, what will be the charge on the vinyl and where did it come from? And although I answered this one time before, let me say it again. So when I'm rubbing this, this is back to this picture right here. When you rub them and you first free up the electrons and then they snap back, they're saying the electrons are snapping back. They have a greater affinity for the vinyl than for the wool. And so as I rub them, the electrons then get uh, over to... <coughs> excuse me, it's terrible. Uh, get over to the vinyl. And of course what comes on this vinyl is not just the original ones that were scraped off when I was rubbing them, but also the ones that were scraped off of the wool. And so that's why we say the wool is negative because it's got more electrons than it does positive. And where did they come from? They came from the wool. And so that's the answer to, to those two parts. The vinyl is negative. And where did those negatives come from? They came from the wool. <clears throat> All right, so let's keep going. Look at step eight here. Uh, step eight says, touch the pit ball with your fingers and this will neutralize it. So remember that stuff we just did back in step one, talking about grounding it. And uh, let's just make sure it's grounded. Now, in case you're wondering, well, why wouldn't it be? Remember we touched it back in step four? And that touching we're going to come back to, we could have put some charges on it. And we actually did. Uh, they haven't asked about that yet. But that's why it's so important here that we touch it and neutralize it. In fact, I'll even neutralize myself back over here at the, at the sink. Okay? But the big thing is getting that pit ball neutral. All right. So I'm going to start again with a neutral pit ball. So it says, touch the pit ball with your fingers to neutralize it. Charge the acetate. All right. So let me find my, my acetate. Here's my acetate. And let me rub. Charge the acetate strip by rubbing the wool and then touch the pith ball. 
And so now we're touching it. In fact, if you'll notice, this is exactly the same thing we did in step four, except for step four we were using the vinyl to touch it. And so now we are touching it with the acetate. And just like in step four, it takes some effort to see this, and this one's a little bit harder still. So let's see if I can get the effects. And this is probably the hardest one of the experiment. Ah, I, can you see it repelling? We want to get it, there we go, to repel. And so I have now brought the acetate, which as we said earlier, it will be positive when we rub it, near that pit ball that I've touched and they repel. And that's the answer you want to put here in step eight. It says what happens and you just want to put they, they, they repel. But, but watch this, and I better do this before the moisture in the air and it's really humid today, uh, takes all the charges off here. But step nine then says now that you've touched it, bring the vinyl. So I've rubbed the vinyl, number of the vinyl's negative near it and see what happens. And hopefully you'll see it attracts. So it's attracted to the vinyl, but it is repelled from the acetate. Let's see if we can get it repelling a little more. We'll touch it. And so, ah, maybe I should have left it alone. It was working a little bit better. There we go. That's a good one there. All right, so it repels from the acetate, but is attracted ooh, to the vinyl. That's our step eight and, and nine. And they even say what happens, and so you could put repel here, but uh, I, hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, in nine is they, they, they attract, they repelled in, in eight. And it says contrast the strength of what happened in step three. Okay, because remember in step three they were uh, attracted, but this one was a lot stronger in its attraction. And so you can write that down. And <clears throat> finally, we're, we're really getting to the, the, the heart of the matter. Uh, like I said, it's too bad, you know, we can't have a, a face to face setting and you guys get to do this yourself. It's kind of fun to, you know, actually rub these and, and, and watch what, what, what happens. But hopefully the big picture you're, you're still getting and then and that's where this, this, this physics is because step 10 says this, the wool has a higher affinity for the electrons than the acetate. So here's the acetate. So when you rub them together, here's the question. What is the sign of the charge on the acetate? What charges moved and how? So again, let me just emphasize, when you take two materials and you rub them together, the rubbing and the bumping is going to strip electrons off. And then since they are made out of different materials, that means the, the positives that are left over, one will be a little bit more attracting those electrons. We call that an affinity for the electrons. And so they're trying to say here that when you take acetate and wool, the wool has a higher affinity than the, the acetate. So when you rub them, where do the electrons go after they get bumped off? They go to the wool. And so the first part of this question says, what is the sign of the charge on the acetate? So I would say the acetate then is positive. There are more positives than negatives on here. And by the way, did you notice I did not say that positives were put on here to make the positives? Right? Did you notice that the reason this is positive because the electrons were off? Do you remember those first four basic ideas at the beginning of this chapter that, or this, this lab that said that the things that move, the mobile pieces, are the electrons? And so when I rub this and say this is positive, I didn't put positives on here. What I did was take negatives off, which makes them more positive than negatives on here. There's still a lot of negatives on here, don't get me wrong. I, really percentage-wise, I, I took off very, very few. Uh, so I only took off a few hundred billion, you know, which sounds like a big number, but that's a small percentage of the number of electrons that, that, are, that are on here. In fact, if you want to always kind of have a fun number, there's more electrons in this piece of acetate than there are stars in the universe. Uh, in fact, there's, there's more electrons in this piece of acetate than there are grains of sand on all the deserts and all the uh, seas of the earth. 
In fact, there are more electrons in here than the sum of all the grains of sand on the Earth and all of the stars in the universe. There's a lot of electrons. So a few hundred billion billion is, is a small number that came off of here. Uh, but more on the numbers as we get into the calculations, and that's not what today's lab is, is, is all about. But I am trying to answer then this, this first question, uh, which says, what is the sign? So this is positive, the acetate. It says, what charges moved? And that was key here. The negatives moved. I want to keep emphasizing that. Because one of the things that hopefully you'll get straight in your mind right away here at the beginning, otherwise things won't make sense, not only for this lab, but for most of the semester, if you start thinking about these positives are moving, the positives aren't moving, the negatives are. And I should say it again, at least in a solid, because in a liquid, you know, the atoms themselves could actually move. In a gas, the atoms could actually move, and those are where the positives might be. But in a solid, the positives do not, do not move. Okay? All right, well... Let me continue on. Uh, number 11. Number 11 says, from the behavior of the balls and the strips in step 4 and step 8. Now, since I've been doing a lot of talking, maybe I should review. What I do in step 4? Well, in step 4, I took a pit ball that was neutral. And I rubbed a piece of vinyl, which now made it negative. I brought it near and I touched it. And I got something like that. I got them to repel. And in step eight, I did something like this. I neutralized the pit ball. I took the acetate. I then touched the acetate. And I might have to do it a couple of times. And I got it to repel. And so that's our summary or our recap. It says, state here the general behavior of like charges. Uh, here's hopefully what you observed in that. That when I touched it with, say, the vinyl, which remember, the vinyl has a bunch of negatives on it, and I touched it, what happened is the some of the negatives came off of the, the vinyl, and that's why it's not easy to do. Vinyl doesn't like to get rid of negatives. Okay, But if I can get it to transfer over, then there will be negatives on the pit ball, and of course, there's still negatives on the acetate. And so I would say I have like charges here. I have negatives. And so that's what step four was about. Whereas step eight <clears throat> was this way. I started with a neutral pit ball. And I took the acetate and made it positive. And of course, positive means it lacks electrons. So when I touched it a few times, uh, some of the electrons from the pit ball jumped over to here. So now the pit ball is lacking electrons, and so the pit ball is now positive, as well as this is being positive. And they repelled. And so both step four and step eight, they repelled, and they were like charges. In step eight, they were both negatives. In step, no, step four, they were both negatives, and in step eight, they were both positives. And so the lesson here, if you didn't catch it in the lecture, let me repeat it here, is that if you ever have like charges together, they repel. That's what this experiment is trying to show you. If they are both negative, they repel. Or if they are both positive, they repel. And so that's what they want you to do. Can you state a general principle of like charges? Yes, like charges repel. That's the answer you should, should type in here for, for step 11. All right, let's look at step 12. And step 12, it says, look at the behavior and what happened in step 5 and step 9. Now, let me just repeat step 5. Here's what we did in step 5. Uh, step five was a continuation of, of four because what we did in four was to make the pit ball negative by touching it and the two negatives repelled. So the pit ball is now negative. Then we put down the vinyl and in step five we rubbed the acetate which we now know is positive and so we brought the positive near the negative and they attracted. And so we made the pit ball negative by touching it in step four. And then we brought the acetate and made it positive by rubbing it with wool. And so now we got the two positives and the... I'm, I'm sorry. We, I said that before. We, we got that negative by touching it with the vinyl. Okay, and some electrons transferred over. And we got this positive by rubbing it with the wool. And so we have then, of course, a negative pit ball. And we have a positive acetate and we have an attraction between them. <coughs> We actually saw the same thing in step 9. We did it in reverse order. We did this. We neutralized it in step 8. <coughs> we then touched it a few times with the positive 
acetate. And like I said, this is the hardest one of the experiment. And I'm not getting much of a repulsion. There, now there, I got a little bit. But now that pit ball is positive, so then in step nine, we were asked to make the vinyl, which we made the vinyl negative by rubbing it with the wool, and so we've got a negative and a positive, and they attract. And so, hopefully, in both of those steps, five and nine, you see that you had opposite charges, and they attracted, and so that's the, the lesson. He says, can you state a general behavior of unlike charges? Yeah, unlike charges attract. It doesn't matter if this one is positive or negative, as long as this one is, is opposite. So if I had a positive and a negative, they would attract. Or if I have a negative and a positive, they would attract. And so we saw, saw both of those. Now, here's a fun one. This 13. 13 says, maybe the most difficult phenomenon to explain is actually what we did at the beginning back in step three, where our pit ball was neutral. Do you remember that one? Well, let me go back to step three, just as kind of a, a recap here. See, step three, you were asked to bring the vinyl near it after you had neutralized it back in step one. So let, let me neutralize my pit ball again here. So I'm going to neutralize my pit ball. And I'm going to grab my vinyl. And I'm going to rub it. Now, we've been learning that the vinyl is now negative. But keep in mind, the pit ball is not negative, it's not positive, it's neutral. And remember, it attracted. So the neutral was attracted to a negative. Uh, you even saw that in step two. In step two, we rubbed the acetate, which we now know is positive. And so here is the positive and a neutral pit ball. And what do we get? We also got attraction. And so your author here in step 13, it says, Ooh, one of the most difficult phenomena to explain is the interaction between a charged body and a neutral pit ball. Can you explain that? So let me help you with that one. Well, let me do that with a picture. And here's where the idea of conductor is going to be so crucial. And the concept that a neutral object has equal number of positives and negatives. It, it's, it's not that it has no charges, it's that it has an equal number of positives and negatives. Watch. Uh, let me take this and call this my piece of vinyl. So if this is the neutral pit ball, and this is the piece of vinyl, let me just put some negatives here to indicate that this Vinyl strip is, is negative charge. That has more negatives than positive. That's what happened when we rubbed it with the wool. But this is neutral. And your first thought is, well, it, it's not going to interact. Because we know if this was negative, it would repel. And if it was positive, it would attract. But remember step six. And remember it's a conductor. Watch. Here's what I mean by that. The negatives that are in the position of the ball that is close to the vinyl strip would get pushed away because remember like charges repel and remember this is a conductor so I would still say that this pit ball is neutral if you were to add up all the negatives in this pit ball and all the positives in this pit ball you would say they balance but they have separated themselves and we call that then polarized. This ball is neutral, but it's also polarized. Now the reason that's important is because if you kind of imagine the pit ball as being two halves, I'll call this the front half. The front half is being attracted towards this strip and the back half is being repelled. If I call this force number one and force number two, again, you might still think, well, okay, then the net force is zero. No, no, the net force would only be zero if those forces were equal. So remember back in step six where we said the force was related to the distance, it was inversely proportional? 
That would tell me that force number one, which is made out of positives, and it's closer, produces a force a little bit greater than force number two. And so there is a net attractive force. In fact, that's really how you, they want you to answer number 13, but I'll take this a step further because if this was step two, and the strip that I'm bringing near the neutral pit ball was acetate, meaning it was positive, what would happen is this positive would attract the electrons to the front part of the ball. So they would come in from the backside. So we would lose electrons over to here, so that's why it's positive, and they would come over to here. And if you split this in half, you would still say this is attracted, so that's F1. Uh, this is then repelled, so that's F2. But because these are closer, F1 is still greater than F2. And so you get a attraction. And so a neutral pith ball, or a neutral anything, is attracted to anything that's charged. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, it's attracted. And so that's why step two, we saw attraction, and then step three, we saw attraction. And of course, what you need to answer and turn in is, is this description. Why does a negative brought near a neutral attract? And so hopefully you can, you know, kind of say these three steps. Step one, the ball becomes polarized. Step two, you get both an attraction and a repulsion. Uh, step three, the attraction is a little bit greater than the repulsion, and therefore we get a net attraction force, a small net attraction force. And that's, that's how they want you to answer 13. So I hope I didn't take too long getting to number 13, but I hopefully then you, you get this bigger picture. In fact, a, a fun experiment to do is to realize then that neutral objects and just go around your house, especially on these hot, humid days, you're probably running a fan run in a ceiling fan. Well, remember, a lot of these fans are made out of plastic or made out of vinyl, and they spin, those blades spin through the air, so they're being rubbed, and they get charged. So the blades on the fan are actually charged to themselves. So what happens to the dust as it goes through? It gets attracted to those blades. And so it doesn't take long for a fan blade to get really dusty. If you have a ceiling fan, I got a challenge for you. Step on a a chair, a ladder, and draw your finger across the top of that fan blade. If it hasn't been cleaned in a while, <laughs> it'll be really, really dusty. It attracts a lot of dust. Or if you have an entertainment center, or some place you, you, know, you put your video games, or you know, your, your, your Xbox if you play you know, video games, or your TV, or your DVR player, and it's sitting on a shelf. If it's been a while since you moved it, all the electronics in there have an electrical charge and they love dust. And so I bet it is really dusty on the back of that thing, underneath the thing. It just sucks up dust like crazy. Uh, I know I have a nice little air filter uh, that I like because uh, I have a, allergies and, and uh, have, have problems uh, breathing, uh, particularly at night. Uh, but it's, a, it's a really neat, it's just a fan. But the design is great. So as the air blows through the fan, there's a metal grid on the outside of the fan. And, uh, I'm sorry. Well, there is a metal grid too. That's a little more sophisticated, but th there's a, just a plastic grid. Um, it's vinyl. And so as the air blows through, that plastic grid gets rubbed by the air blowing through and it builds up charge. And so then the dust and the pollen that comes up sticks to it. And so what comes out is pretty clean air and so maybe once every three or four days, I take off that little plastic cover and I look at it, it's just coated with dust. And so then I can just hose it off outside or even just put it up into the shower and it'll just kind of wash off all that dust and I put it back in there. And so it's, it's cleaning out all the dust because a really neat property here is that neutral objects are attracted to anything that's positive. And so and anything that's positive could be anything that rub in. So it's, it's very simple just to have this plastic grid in front of the fan. It gets charged up and then it attracts all the pollen and dust and dander in there. All right, anyways, I should keep going because I, I didn't want this to go quite this, this long here, but let's, 
keep going here. Because the last one before we kind of switch gears here is 14. And this is one that is near the end of the uh, lecture. And so unless you've listened to both lectures, let me just kind of explain this. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in a, in, a, in a picture here. So let me kind of clean off the, on the board here. But it says here, since the charge strips did not actually touch the bodies that exerted forces on them, what physical phenomenon is being illustrated here? Uh, so why don't I just look at step number uh, four. See, in step number four, we had taken the vinyl, and once we rubbed it with the wool, it became negative. And we first touched the pit ball, so that made the pit ball negative. In fact, you noticed I had to do it maybe two or three times before I really got it negative. Okay. But then we saw that they repelled each other, and so that's why we answered that like charges, two negative charges would re re repel each other. But there is something very, very important to comprehend. And let's see if I've got blue on here. I do. Because the author of your book, at least the survey book, likes to label electric fields in blue. Uh, I need to check that out. I'm trying to remember from last year. I'm pretty sure it's blue. Um, or is it orange? Well, I'm going to draw electric fields in blue and I'll double check that. But this is what they're trying to say. It's not just that this is negative and this is negative and they, they repel. That's what Coulomb discovered. But Gauss and others went a little bit further and discovered that there is something a little bit more going on. Let me get rid of the pit ball for a second. They said that if you didn't even have a second charge here, the first charge isn't just a charge, it also makes something. Something you can't see with your eyes, but you can detect with experiments. It makes an electric field. And then, when a second charge is put near the first charge, it's pushed away, not just because this is a negative charge, but it's pushed away by the field itself. The field is the mechanism of how the force gets to that object. Uh, it would be like saying, you see this pin in Physics 121? Well, we did this. We, we, we held the something up above the air. We let it go. And we said gravity pulled it down. We said the earth pulled it down. But how did the earth pull it down? And in Physics 21, we didn't go that far. <coughs> but what's happening is the Earth itself makes above it a field. And this then is placed in the field. And it's the field that grabs it and it's the field that, that pulls it down. And so it's not just that the Earth pulls down on the pen. It's that the Earth creates a field and the field pulls down on the pen. Uh, there is a mechanism of how that force gets across here. And that's what we're trying to say here. You may not be able to see these blue lines. Uh, you may not see what we're going to call the electric field. But that electric field is, is, is there. You can test for it. Human eyes can't detect it. But we can run little experiments with it. And so this is a bit more complicated than just as Coulomb first discovered it. And maybe as you might have learned it in your high school physics, it's not just, oh, yeah, two negatives repel each other. No, no, no. It's the first negative makes a field, and then the second one is pushed by that field. And so that's why far more important is not Coulomb's law, but the electric field. Notice the title of the first chapter is not Coulomb's law. The title of the first chapter is electric fields. Far more important far more fundamental. Anyways, and so that's what they're trying to get out here. And so, like I said, uh, that more advanced part of it doesn't really show up until late in the first lecture or the, or the second lecture. Um, and it's something that may even be new to you because uh, if you took in, in your high school physics, you, you know, you might have just talked about, oh yeah, two negatives, they repel each other. Coulomb's law. Mm -hmm, sure.
Two positives, oh yeah, they repel each other. Negative and positive. And you never got into the mechanism to what we can't see with our eyes, but it's that, that field. So that's why we like to draw a lot of pictures. We can kind of kind of understand that a little bit better. All right, well, I better keep going because I'm, I'm hopefully giving you a lot more information than you probably would have discovered. Like I said, this uh, online uh, lab is got its pros and its cons. And I think one of the pros here is that I can elaborate a, a little bit more. Uh, but also, hopefully, you pick that up in the reading and the lecture, too. But, you know, if not, that's why we do it multiple times here. And so, hopefully, you're, you're getting that. All right, well, we're going to switch gears. I probably should have moved my uh, electroscope under the heat lamp. Uh, you'll probably notice this whole time I, I keep putting things under the heat lamp because it's really humid today, a lot of moisture, and... Uh, H2O molecules uh, have their charges and they totally interrupt our experiments and kind of kind of hard to do. So that's why I, I, I put the heat lamp out here today so that uh, we'll have success, hopefully. And so, so far we've had success. Uh, a lot of times these are, these are hard. In fact, I guess that's one advantage of this online uh, lab also is that I can make sure you see the right thing. I know that uh, a lot of times I in an online setting, I got to go around and people are doing getting weird results and it's because of the moisture or they're not rubbing hard enough or they're just not do, doing it right here and so at least at least this way I can keep doing it till I get it right and I and I know what it's supposed to to illustrate so maybe that's a, a positive all right but we still got what 10 more questions here to do together so let's go to number 15 number 15 introduces you to a thing called an electroscope and number 15 is just asking you to to label it and so let me kind of why it's under the heat lamp and hopefully not too hot that I can still handle it I can kind of hold it up here and I don't want to take it too far apart but I'm hoping you could because it's really delicate I'm hoping you can see that this metal piece at the top which I'll call a knob is connected to two metal pieces all the way through down here um, and there's two this side hopefully looks like gold is it is a gold foil and the other side looks like a, a stainless steel uh, if I hold it this way and tilt it maybe gravity will make the the foil uh, tilt down and so you can see that one of the pieces of melt uh, of metal and again metal conductor this is going to be important uh, can move and the other one can't. It's a little stiffer because uh, it's a little thicker. It's an eighth of an inch stainless steel piece. Gravity wouldn't make it move. Uh, you'd take a lot of force to bend that eighth of an inch. But the foil, really, really thin. Uh, that's why we make it out of gold. Uh, it's really, really thin. Uh, we, you can't cut aluminum foil this thin. And so it's really, really light. And it's a conductor. So, notice that it's a conductor all the way through. That's what's important. So these lower two, let's call them leaves. One is moved, so let's call it a movable leaf, and the other one is fixed, so let's call it a fixed leaf, and the top is a knob. And so you're asked one, two, three, four, five uh, descriptions here, and so label the, the two lower things, the fixed leaf and the movable leaf, and the top part, the knob. Uh, they actually got a round thing. We don't, we don't have a round thing on ours, but in the picture they show this big round thing. It looks like a knob, so label that as a knob. Uh, another important thing, and I... We'll tilt it a little towards you so you, you, you can see. But uh, up here is a rubber stopper. What's important is it's rubber and rubber is an insulator. Uh, remember I said a few times, what's, what's key here is to understand the behavior is different for a conductor versus an insulator. Okay? And I'll draw a few pictures here, but this is important to know that I have an insulator here. And so we are going to call that just the insulated stopper. Um, let's see, I think he uses the words here. Sketch the electroscope. He says, notice there's a stopper. So he just calls it stopper. He doesn't call it an insulated stopper. But, but I want you to know it's insulated. Now, it's also shielded with this metal thing. So let's call this a metal can around the outside. And that's what the other thing. They're, ta they're talking about a shield. And in our case, we have a shield that not is only metal around this side of it, but the front and back are made out of glass. And that way wind, or just me standing here, my breath would be too much, and it would hit that foil and, and, and tear it off. So I, there's no wind currents in here. It's all locked up. You can see we've got tape around here. All right, so that's enclosed. 
And those are the names of the parts of this electroscope. So that's what step 15 is. So, 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 so write those down. Uh, now, if you're doing this on a com computer screen, uh, do some kind of rough drawing. You can just take circles and lines and make an electroscope and label them. If you're doing this by hand, just kind of draw freehand sketch the electroscope and label those five parts. All right. But you need to know those names before we go further. But importantly, you also need to know what parts were a conductor, which parts can move, and which parts were an insulator. Okay? Because watch this. Step 16. It says bring the negatively charged strip. Now, if you remember, the negatively charged strip was this vinyl. So I'm going to bring the vinyl and I'm going to rub it. All right. Bring the negatively charged strip near the electroscope, but do not touch the knob. What happens and what happens when the strip is removed? All right. So they're not really asking you to explain what happened yet. So I, uh, I'll be careful not to go that far yet. But let's just watch what, what happens. And I think I've got the angle. So you can see it on the video camera. And so if I bring it near the knob, oh, wow. I take it away, wow. And so hopefully what you're seeing is when I bring it close, the movable leaf moves out. And when I pull it back, the movable leaf falls down. And that's what they want you to observe. So uh, what happens? The movable leaf moves out. That's, that's what they want you to answer. And then, of course, what happens when the strip is removed? The movable leaf, you can say, falls back or collapses back. Okay? All right. Now, 17 is they want you to explain it, I think. Look at 17. It says, describe the movement of electrons when the negatively charged charged strip is brought near the electroscope. And please remember that air is not a conductor. And I think it's best if I draw a picture here. And so let me kind of clean this off here and see if this made any sense to you. Um, I have up at top the knob. Now surrounding the knob is this rubber 